You guys all just walk around in a big herd. It worries me. Do you? Oh, so you don't stick it together? Get all that work done? You're going to have to by the end of the semester. <laughs> getting some lunch and getting some work done. <laughs> Exciting. Okay, I think I have the Zoom session started. See if you can get to it. It was acting a little weird, but I think it's going. I think I remembered things for us. Let's see. We are in week five. It was our unit one exam. You guys are doing that at home. Don't forget because you have until Sunday night for that. Don't forget. And today we're just going to do more looping practice since we made that home homework. We'll bring up some stuff to try to help us. So let's open Visual Studio and let's open that same project we were working on last time, our for loop practice. And I just want to create a couple more projects and then we'll be all done with it. I don't know if we had anybody that was missing last time. I know we were all in our wrong places, so it's hard for me to tell. I think everybody was here. But if you have anybody that's missing, you guys go to your study group, send an email to them if you need some code or something that you're missing. Don't forget all of our sessions are out on YouTube. All the Zoom sessions that are recorded are available out there on YouTube. So if there's a spot where you got behind or something when we were coding, you can bring up that Zoom session and review it. I noticed last semester that some people did a lot better with videos because they could stop and pause and move back and forth. And I just keep going because I, you know, because I started teaching during that no child left behind thing, right? And I'm like, we will leave people behind. That's our goal now, right? We don't want everybody out there programming or the, the wages will go down. So, yeah, the link is at the beginning of your module section under the same thing as the syllabus. And that's the link to the, uh, the YouTube videos. Uh-huh. Awesome. To all of our Zoom. Oh, I guess it's sending you messages about them. How you can find them. Yeah, because I don't send out any messages for them. The same way with the code. Whenever we, our class gets done, that Zoom video has to go through a conversion process. And then when I upload it to YouTube, you know there's time there where everything's just kind of, I'm stuck. I can't really do much because I've got to stay on that um, YouTube session to get it uploaded. So I don't do very good at uploading projects and code and things like that, because I feel like it, all of it's in the video, and everybody's better off if they type it themselves and go through the video. So if you need some code or something like that, go to your study group and ask them if they can hook you up with that, and they'll get you all set. Now, we were looking at our for loop. So my project name is Chapter 3, For Loops 102. That's the one I'm going to open. Hello, YouTube. This project is the one, or the solution, is the one we were working on last time. There should be two. Yeah, be Is it? Are they on the C drive? Well, yeah, I had it's not saving them right. Save, so last time it well, let's saved. see what we can do about that then. I better just violate my rule and post this. Let me let me zip it up. Hang on. Yeah, because there's several of you guys on the different computers. And I'm actually keeping my stuff on the C drive, too. Um, that's not the best for us. So make sure you're saving your projects to your H drive or the S drive or some other cloud-based place. Your um, OTC Microsoft Office OneDrive would be the best place, you know, and then you could get to it from home and school. <laughs> Let me get this one fixed. 
It's gonna say it shouldn't have changed. <laughs> They're like, well, <laughs> there should be a test. Okay, here's our class. I'm gonna go to the announcements and I'm gonna add that zip file of projects from last time. Maybe will let me and um, if you need this file let me get it out here because it's a zip file when you download it you need to make sure you do extract all files before you open it in Visual Studio Visual Studio won't be able to open this while it's in a compressed format. So whenever we're working with a zip file, we always need to extract before we do anything. So if I wanted to do that, I would click on it to download it. And then for me, just my way of doing it, I would click on the little arrow and show in folder because that's going to show it to me in File Explorer. And then it's selected. There it is. Yay, I was waiting. So I can right click and choose extract all. I also could use the compressed <laughs> folder tools and click on that pink tab and then the extract all icon would show up. Either way, I just have to make sure that I've extracted all of that before I open it in Visual Studio. This is one of those ones where as an instructor, you go around and you try to not sound pricey, right? And then after the fifth time you look at somebody sample the project because they haven't extracted from the zip file, you start sounding right. <laughs> yes, sir. You always want the dollar. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, the folder, I don't know exactly. If it's acting the same, it might be fine. Okay. It's not one I've ever used. So. Right. Like mine is on the Yes. Good job. Everybody's just doing a great job at picking up all of the pieces here. We really do have a lot. I showed the other class last time, but I didn't show you. I went to, um, you don't have to go here to this website. I'll go real quick. And I just went to glassdoor.com, which is a job search website. And I searched for C Sharp in Springfield, Missouri. And there's actual jobs. You don't know how awesome that is because we're in a pretty small market. It used to be hard to find these things. But if you look at C-Sharp on Glassdoor, you'll see there are a lot of opportunities. Jack Henry, Jack Henry, Jack Henry would like to talk to you guys. <laughs> we have Gravitate, which is a great place to work. I know a few people that worked at Carmac. I don't remember much about it, but I know it's kind of a familiar name. We have some electric companies that are always good places to work, utility companies that are looking, um, some secure wireless. We have actually a couple of security companies and you know those companies could end up being worth a lot. It's hard to know. Systems architect, software development, interns. So there are lots and lots of different things available. Look at this, this one snuck in. It's not for C Sharp, it's for Ruby on Rails. But you guys are going to have so much experience, you'd be able to go to the Code Academy site for Ruby and pick it up real quick if 
you wanted to. Sure. Sure. Real quick. I That's think you we'll could real that. quick, real quick. So let's see what some of the salaries. How about this one here at Jack Henry? Let's go to that top one, 86000 I like to always kind of remind people, what's, what, how much is $10 an hour worth? Not a lot. I use it because it's real nice and even, right? I don't like doing math on the board. But let's say $10 an hour. How much do the McDonald's people make? Is that what they're making now or they make more? Eight sixty? What? What? In Jackson, McDonald's went to ten bucks an hour years ago, so we need more more competition. Yeah, yeah, probably. Or else they said, Oh no, we just we just announced it. We didn't something occurred. Oh well it's gonna take us another five packs to get this done. Okay, so let's say you work forty hours a week at your ten dollar an hour job. That's four hundred dollars a week. Right? Now we know they're gonna take out like two thirds of that, right? For taxes and, in, well, you won't have any insurance, but um, you know, things, taxes and social security and all of those things. So we won't get all that money, but it starts out at $400 a week. How many weeks in a year? 52. 52. Like I said, I like even math. So we'll try 50. Is that right? Comes out to $20,000 a year. I could add those other two that I left out, that would be $20,800. So $20,800 a year for working 40 hours a week at $10 an hour versus $86,000 a year for working 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year. So yeah, it makes a big difference, doesn't it? A big difference. So the reason I showed the eight o'clock class is because people were getting discouraged People were feeling like, I don't understand. I don't know what's going on. And I want them to know there's good reason to work hard to figure things out. And people get paid this much because not everybody can do this job. Right? It's, yeah, it's $41 an hour. Is it 41 You guys figured it out? That $41 an hour doesn't really sound like that much compared to what I've heard some people say they were asking somebody for. So you guys are all going to be worth that and more. So just remember, I, like I said, I love those OTC commercials. You've got a dream. We've got a plan. Because you do have a dream, and it's really good to remember that. You know, you're working towards something. It's not just like when you're, you know, go into an estate sale and find a more junk that you don't need. That's not really working towards something, right? But in here, you guys are. You're working towards something really important. And I really value the fact that you're working so hard. So I think it's important to know. Sometimes people get mad and they're like, that teacher. All right, so we've got our project. Everybody's found it now. I think I lost mine. Let me find it again. I was thinking about money. I got all sidetracked. <laughs> okay. So let me zoom in here a little bit. Visual Studio is not listening to me. Come on, Visual Studio. <laughs> Somebody wants some money. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be a little bit better than that, I think. Probably. So, what do we have here in our project? Our first one was our basic for loop. If you look at your basic for loop, remember we just were looking at. Let me make it big. Uh, no, this oh, it did eventually. <laughs> we have code. We'll see that our basic for loop. We tried to just. Split up those three sections of that for loop to make it more understandable so that we could see that those different things are going on. You won't ever see a for loop coded this way. Everybody always puts all three things together on one line unless they just won't fit. I just wanted to separate it out so we would see the different parts. Now, the next thing that we did was parts of for loop. And in this one, we used a variable. To control things and again we saw that we could leave out our initialization part of our for loop and still have a valid for loop next was the box for loop box now this one starts getting a little complicated next week 
we'll be working on method and starting with classes so that we can break the, the code up a little bit. We're getting a little bit too much code here in our main, getting a little bit harder to handle. So we'll clean that up next week as we get started with all of our methods. But for now, if we look at our for loop box, if you remember, we just set up some variables to be our controlling information. And then we set up some nested for loops so that we could try different looping mechanisms. Now I know everybody's been working on their triangles, and this one was to prepare you for that, so make you think about it. I saw some flashes of understanding that every time the outer for loop runs once, our inner for loop runs from beginning to end. Then our outer for loop runs again, and our inner for loop runs from beginning to end. So really encouraged you guys, remember to make sure that you're running these using the debugger, especially with for loops. It can be a really complicated concept for people to understand and visualize. And if you just keep using the debugger, stepping through that code and seeing what, what's gonna happen next, it'll really help you to clarify those things in your head. Because remember, it doesn't matter if the person beside you understands. We need to get it where you understand so it's not a problem for you. Yeah, that's that's a lifesaver. It really is helpful. And lots of times if someone asks me what their problem is in their code, I'll say, have you run it through the debugger? Because it can, I don't know why the debugger like scares some people. They're like scared of it. They're like, well, I, 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 don't, I don't like to use it. Don't be scared. Jump in there. Try it. It's not going to hurt anything. It's just going to help you with stuff. So anytime you're feeling trepidatious, like worried about doing something, just try it. Remember, you're not going to really cause any trouble. All right, so let's try um, a loop here where we're going to do a little bit. Let me find it. This one's going to be named Super Intelligently. And we're just going to call this one More Practice. Let's make that book. Now I have somebody in one of the other classes that has their master's in creative writing. Do you think they could write that book for us? <laughs> we'll split it, so we wanna split the profits. All right, so in our solution, let's create a new project. I'm gonna add new project. And I'm gonna name this one More Practice. Because at 8 o'clock this morning, I couldn't think of another thing to name a looping program. So now let's rename our program.cs. More practice. I <laughs> see sharpening our bridge works. That's cute. Oh, wait, wait. Is Python better? Let's check. I didn't go do it. I didn't check. But let's do it. You asked for it. Python. Um, 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 wrong search box. Wrong search box. Search something else. How about that one? Doesn't matter. Did not find any matches. Yeah, <laughs> I can go as a McDonald's manager. So remember, Python is fun. It's an up and coming language. It's gaining popularity by the minute, but it's not there yet. So it's not the language you can use to support your family right yet, at least not in our area. You might be able to someplace else. But a lot of use in the scientific community where people are um, calculating with large data big data values. Okay, so this application, we're gonna do something just a little different. Not a whole lot. First, let's declare a variable. This variable is going to be an integer, and we're gonna name it counter. And we're gonna initialize it to a value of zero. Now, before we do anything else, we're just gonna go into a loop. Now, we're gonna use a while loop. So I would like this while loop to execute 10 times using my counter. So while my counter is less than what? 11. 
or I could do less than or equal to 10. And I've seen people say good things about both ways. A lot of this stuff that I'm seeing lately says we want to simplify our comparison operator. So if we did greater than or equal to 10, that would be a more complicated operator than just less than 11, less than and equal to, not greater than. All right, so now I want my open and closing curly braces for this while loop. I could actually just label that closing curly brace at this point. That's the end of my while. Below that is the end of my main method. Below that, my pink one is the end of my class. And my orange one is the end of my namespace. Now I've noticed the Viasphora keeps those colors pretty consistent. My class one is always the really pink one. We don't want that silly, silly person. It's the person that you're going to be paying for. <laughs> All right, so in our while loop, we're just going to write out a line. Um, I'd like to use the write line statement without having to put the console dot in front of it. So I'm going to go up here and fix my using. Using static system.console. Now, another thing that I'd like to do in this program, because we haven't really been doing it a lot, is put our comments in. Sometimes when we're doing our sample programs, I like, I like to try to limit our comments to just really specific things that I want to point out. But then that might give you the wrong impression for turning things in. So let's put some comments in here like we are ready to turn this in. I want the comments to be right above the class statement. So I'm going to open a new line of code right there above my class. And I'm going to type the three slashes. And those three slashes tell the Visual Studio IDE that we want to do a special kind of comment. Notice it put those tags in for us. Now what I want here is I'm going to put that our class is more practice. The developer is going to be you. And I really, really love seeing your name in your code. Whenever we're looking at Hypergrade, you guys know you're getting that feedback back from Hypergrade. You know if your program was right or not. But when I look at Hypergrade and I look at um, Canvas and I see that I've got the matching name and everything's good, then I feel a lot better about putting in the grade. It's really easy when you're looking at so many different places to get off on things. So it's nice to have that confirmation that that's whose stuff I'm looking at. So yeah, I'll notice if it's not the same in Canvas as Hypergrade, ETW. Now let's go ahead and put a date here. And usually, again, that date is when we start a development of the program. It could be months ago and we might still be working on it, but it's usually when we started. Our purpose here is to try more loop stuff. And that would be a good header comment to tell anybody looking at this class file a little bit about what's going on with it and who the developer is so they know if they want to work on it or not. Okay, so now I'm finally ready. I'm going to come down into my while and put my right line. And for this one, we're going to use some formatting. So I'm going to say the first thing that I want to write out is parameter zero. And I want it to take up five characters of space. After that, I want to do a tab. So I'll do a backslash T character to indicate a tab. Then I'm going to have another parameter that I also want to take up five columns. Then I'm going to do another tab. And finally, the third, a third item that I want to print out. And I want it to take up five columns. Now, this is our definitely funky C-sharp syntax, right? Just look at all these curly braces and hieroglyphic characters. 
Remember that we have all of these formatting parameters within, close, within our curly braces. We always start with the parameter number, which some of you have seen has to start at zero, has to be sequential. And the comma indicates that we have some specifiers that we're going to apply to this formatting parameter. And the number five just says we want it to be five columns wide. So that's what we're doing. All of those formatting characters put together are within our string that's going to be printed out. After our string, then, we're going to put a comma to start specifying the parameters that we want to print. Well, for parameter one, I'd like to print out our counter. Parameter two, I want to use the math library pow function, which is a power of, and I want to take counter to the power of two. Next, I want to use math.pow again, and I want to take cow counter to the power of three. So in my right line, I'm just going to be printing out the counter, the counter to the power of two, and the counter to the power of three. Why do I have that weird blue squiggly line under my test condition in my while loop? So what do you what does that mean? Are we looking at creating an infinite loop here? Let's try it. Let's save, because remember, we always want to save if we are infinite looping, especially if we don't know we are. So let's save. Now let's run this, because that's what that blue thing is saying. It says that you've never updated counter in the loop, so how's the loop going to end? Well, it's right. It's not going to end. Let's see what happens. Oh, I'm still printing my box. Let's fix that. I need to make my more practice my startup project. Now I should be able to create an infinite loop. And I'm just gonna see a bunch of zeros, right? Because remember, everything we're printing out is based on our counter, and since our counter isn't changing, it's just staying zero all the time, we're just gonna get a whole bunch of zeros. Again, we can look at the diagnostic tools and see our memory just going up. But in the end, we have an infinite loop. It's no good, so let's cancel it or stop it. So now I know, yep, I need to put something in my code to increment my counter so that eventually it makes my loop stop. So let's run that. And how come you wouldn't do that in the while parameter? The while loop doesn't allow you to do that. Oh, that's just the for loop. loop. Yep. So great. Now let's run it and see if we're working right. Whoops, need a read key in there. Where should that read key go? Outside the while. Outside the while. So after the end of my while, but before the end of my main. Now that should be a good spot and it should hold that open for us. Perfect. So now we're seeing all of those numbers. We didn't do any fancy headings or anything. But notice with that five, that number five, that we could do headings pretty easy with that because it's really, it's really giving us these nice columns. <coughs> so we have that tab character in between them that's spreading things out a little bit. But it's giving us nice columns with a width of five so that we could line things up easily. So let's add another loop. After the end of our while, Let's do a for loop. So I'm going to do a right line command and say now a for loop. So in our for loop, I want to use a different variable. We don't want to use that same counter because we've used it for a while loop. So let's start our for loop and say that we're going to use an integer named for count. So it's our counter for our for loop. And we want to start it at zero. And we want 
to run until it's not less than 11. And we want to increment that each time. Oh, okay. If you get that error, let's all try it. Go to your build menu and on build, choose build or rebuild solution. Sometimes Visual Studio doesn't think you've changed enough to compile your program. And so sometimes you have to force it, but let's make sure that's still yet. Turn them off. I found that option again the other day. Turn off all of their spamming on me. All right, so you're working, you're working. We got it working, I think. Did it work? All right, good. Okay, so we've got this for loop here, and we want to kind of do the same thing in our for loop as we did in our while loop. 
So let's create our right line statement. And again, we're going to do this seriously fancy formatting, 0, 5, within the curly braces. Close that thing. Backslash T for a tab. 0, 5, 1, 5 for our second one. Make sure everything is in your double quotes. Backslash T. And 2, 5. Now, if you notice, when I was typing these in, the color coding can kind of help us here. If I don't have a space after that comma, notice how it's colored a little bit different. You're gonna, we want to try this, but we can actually have trouble getting this formatting to work. It might not print out right because it's not properly spaced. So when we're doing things inside of these curly braces that are doing parameters, we can get some weird errors if things aren't quite right. I'm going to leave that where I don't have that space character so we can see if it generates any trouble for us or if it's just a, a color thing that doesn't really matter. Okay, so what replacement values do we want to use? Well, we want to use our four count, and then we'll use math. Dot pow, and this time we want to use our four count to the power of two. And then our third parameter will be math.pow four count to the power of three. So we'll have it squared and then cubed. Now for this one, and we don't have to do anything to update our counter variable because the for loop is taking care of it for us. So let's see what else we got. We've got an end of our four. Should be able to try it. I want another question. Mm hmm. On the screen. Can we stop doing that? It makes it hard to read. I was wondering if it did or not. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of too distracting for everybody. Yeah. So let me said, get everybody to stop there. All right, so what? Is it going to work? Let's try it. Now I see that I have my output from my while loop, and then I have my output from my for loop. So great, we got to produce the same exact thing from our different loops, not too different. Okay, so let's go in and after our for loop, Let's output a line that's kind of a summary. So this is going to go right after my for loop, and I want to write out a line that says counter is now, and then I'll use a parameter, and I want to replace my parameter with our counter variable. What should that be when we run? 11, 10, something around there. Not a thousand. <laughs> 10 or 11. Let's try it. See. Ah, oh, good. 11. So, what about our four count? Let's add a right line for it. Four count is now. And then I want to replace with four count. We'll have this just the same as that previous one. Why is it giving me an error? Because the four count variable is inside the four loop. Yeah. So it's our scope. So whenever we're looking at declaring a variable, you guys are exactly right. When we declare a variable, we can kind of look at the body that it's declared in. So up here, I declared a counter is an integer. What body is it in? Well, it's in the body of our main method. That's what open and closing curly braces and curves look in. So that means I can access that counter variable anywhere in that main method, right? 
Now the scope of our four count, however, it was created or allocated or declared in the for loop. So its scope is limited to that for loop body. So we can't see it anyplace else. So what could I do? I want to be able to print out its closing value. How could I fix that? You declare the four count variable at the very top of your counter. Okay. But you'd have to delete the uh, data type in the for loop parameter thingy. That sounds good. Now my four count, I'll go ahead and not give it an initial value. I'm going to do it in my loop. Or I could just go ahead and give it one and take that whole initial step out of that for loop, right? Because now we've already set, set up our integer variable and we've initialized it to zero. So we don't need that initialization phase of our for loop. We could leave it in there if we wanted. So if we wanted to just say for count equals zero, we could. Now if you, excuse me, if you declared it equal to zero up on the top, then is that where like in the for loop you could just do like a semicolon to start that? And not have to put four count, you know, and they go to four count less than a Uh-huh. So that's what we'll do right here. Yep. So we're just going to do that. We'll just init, just get rid of all that stuff. And so we don't even need that step. So now we've got our four count set where we should be able to see it after our for loop. Let's run and make sure we should get the same results from it as we do from our counter. Now, tell them what the five is for, because I said it like 500 times, and I'm not going to say it anymore. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Obviously, they didn't get it when I said it. <laughs> we need to hear someone else's beautiful voice. All right, so this program is basically done. Anything else that we need to do to it? I don't think so. We've got everything just about perfect. Look at this. It's ready to turn in. Too bad it's not code that we need to turn in. Yes, sir? Right, that's just a number of spaces we want this column this to be a column. Yeah, but now we're using the Well, let's try, if you don't pass it something, it's going to get mad at you. Let's try some things. You guys have good questions. So let's say we want this first, um, we want 15, 25, and 35. Let's see how that impacts that first while loop output. It's going to be bigger. Let's try it. So now you can see how it made it take up all that space. It made it that column be that wide. So it's kind of like creating columns in our output if we put that extra number. Now, next thing I think you're asking, what if we don't supply a parameter, a replacement value for number two? We should get an error. It, notice that I don't get a syntax error though. We get a runtime error. So the, the compiler doesn't find that there's this problem. It doesn't find it until we're running. And it says, look, you've got a format exception. This looks like a really big problem, right? It doesn't say you're missing a parameter for your replacements in your output. So we have to be careful with that. What would be the purpose of the tab if you're adding all those spaces? Like you probably wouldn't oh. have it like that if you were doing a lot of columns, unless somebody else had already done it that way. Let's try one other, though. There's an actual new feature we can use with C Sharp, and it just came out not too long ago with the newest version of C Sharp that we're using. And 
we can have some better replacement values. Let's try it. I'm going to do another right line statement. And in this right line statement, I'm going to put a dollar sign before my double quotes. That dollar sign says that I'm going to do this new style replacement where I'm going to put something like counter is, and then inside a set of curly braces, I can actually put the name of the variable. And if I put my closing parenthesis, hopefully everything will be happy. Now, this one is new. Sure. Maybe. Uh huh. So you can do this instead of the ugly ones we've been doing, yeah. Right. And why would I make you go through all these zeros? Because they're awful. The reason is everywhere you go that's looking at C sharp code, you're going to see this kind of code with these zeros and ones for your replacement value. Because this style is so new that it's not out there anywhere. You're not going to see it anywhere. It's a lot better. And it's obviously probably what we want to use. And if you want to go to that style, I have no problem with it. But unfortunately, we have to keep looking at this kind of old style for a little while, because that's what you're going to see everywhere when you look at code. So I've got to find the exact wording for what that new style is. I can't remember the exact term. You always put a dollar sign before. The dollar sign has to come before. So each line, each right line. Uh -huh. Each time you have a new set of double quotes, you so have to have the dollar sign. Variables, but then that mm -hmm. one dollar sign. Right. right. So, so say you can concatenate two uh, strings, we get to put another dollar sign into the next set of quotes. Uh -huh. so Anytime you start another set of double quotes, you, you would have to put the dollar sign, sign if you want. Mm -hmm. And it's interpolation, it's like string interpolation is the big word, which is why I can't remember it. But if you want to do string interpolation within a string, you have to have the dollar sign at the beginning of it. But it, it just came out with C-sharp 7.0, the, the version of C-sharp we're using. So it's not been around for a very long time. So this is one of those things where it does make it hard on new programmers. There are different syntaxes that you'll see in different places. But you've got it. You can handle it. Remember that dollar sign, meaning the interpolation, I can just put the field name, the variable name, right in the string. Make sure it works. There's our counter coming out each time now because we added that in. Okay, so some comments. Let's put some in here. This first one is string interpolation. <laughs> yeah, I think that's where they came up with it. They must have been watching some CSI show or something. That's what we are. Then the one under it, this um, formatting with column size specifications. Let's try it. Will we be able to tell we have to add something else? Yeah, it did it. Because now it's scooching it way over and it's hugely unreadable. <laughs> So it still did it. And like if I wanted to do the currency, can we do that? I'm not sure about the formatting as currency. Nah, we'd have to do a little more research on that one. But we'd be able to figure it out. So string interpolation versus standard formatting of our output parameters. And then we looked at our for loop doing the same thing. 
great. Lots of stuff in there. So anything you're comfortable with, use. If you're not comfortable with it, experiment with it and figure out why so that you can feel comfortable with it. Any questions about that one before we start our other one? Lots of good things in there. I think that one was really good. I'm going to do a save all and I'm going to start a new project. And I want this project to be, what do I want? Continuing loop. I said, hard to come up with names. So in this program, we're going to do a little bit different type thing. Let's rename our program.cs. Rename continuing loop. And then I want to set this one as my startup project. I'll act like I'm going to remember to do all those things. <laughs> all right, so let's get this ridiculous salary off the board. And think about how we're going to do this program. This one is going to be kind of like the bunnies one that is your unit exam that's due this weekend. In, in the bunnies, you're supposed to ask people if they want to calculate how many bunnies they'll have after so many generations. They're supposed to enter like minus one to stop. So that's going to make this a little bit different. What we're going to do is we're going to ask our user, um, for a number. So let's say we're going to say enter num1 and then we're going to ask them for another number, enter num2. My flowchart is going to leave out the fact that we'll be validating this input because otherwise my flowchart would get too long. And then we're going to do something like say Figure out which one's bigger. If num1 is greater than num2, we want to output num1. Otherwise, we want to output num2. And you can see why I never write by hand. I'm a typer. I can sort of read it, but not super well. Okay, so here we're going, we got our if, everything's good. Now, after we've output which number is bigger to the user, we're gonna ask them again, would you like to continue? And if they say yes, I'm gonna go up here and enter num1 again. If they say no, we will just end our program. So not the most beautiful flowchart ever in the world, but kind of the pictorial view for us of what we want this program to do. So don't forget, like that. don't forget your design tools from your 120 class. Sometimes when you need to get your thoughts straight, that's what those tools are for. Your pseudocode, flowchart, try to kind of get on in your mind how this logic is gonna flow, and then it'll be a little easier to write the program. So as I look at this one, I'm thinking, gosh, this looks like a bottom controlled loop, doesn't it? Because it's way down here, sending us back up to the top if it's true. And we're gonna ask the user for number one and number two the first time, no matter what happens with this loop down here. So I think it's a bottom controlled. So let's start out that way. I'm gonna start out by creating a variable to hold that continue choice. We'll make it a string. We'll call it C-O-N-T. What happens if we call it continue? It's a keyword. Causes all sorts of trouble, gets us all real mad. So we'll say that our continue is set to Y right now. And then for our loop, 
I'm going to make it a do. And I want my while part to say while our continue variable equals y. Now, when I typed do, I pressed tab is what made the IntelliSense editor drop the rest of that stuff into the editor for me. If you thought I was an amazingly fast typer, thanks, but no. I just pressed tab and it put, did the curly braces and the while part and everything. So I could just type from there. All right, so in this do loop then, we said that we're going to ask them if they want to continue. All right, let me go up and fix some things. I told you I was pretending I was going to have it all together, but never. So I want to do using static system.console. I want to make some comments here. Class is going to be continuing loop. Now in this program, we're going to prompt for two numbers repeatedly. I'm going to go ahead and tab this. Okay, beautiful. Now I'm just in our do while loop. I want to put in the... Um, prompt to ask the user if they want to continue or not. So I'm going to do that part first, kind of the end. So I'm going to put it in my do while loop. I want to write out a message. I'm going to start it with a new line and I want it to just say continue. And then I'll put y slash n within parentheses and a question mark. There is. Now, with our continue message, once we've written that out, we need to read in what the user responds, and we want to save that in our CONT variable. So I'll set that to the read line. He's thinking ahead, isn't he? Let's run this. See if our loop is working. I don't have a read key or anything in here. Shouldn't need it because we have our while loop that'll take care of things for us. So I'm going to say continue. I'm going to do an uppercase Y. Make sure it works. It does. And then I'll just type anything else and it should stop. So I like the two upper idea. But I think that I want something different for this time because we haven't done a lot of practice with um, compound conditions. How can we add an OR condition to this while so that we could take our CONT variable equal to equaling uppercase Y, Y or lowercase Y? No, no, that's called actually. Vertical bar. Vertical bar, yeah. And I call those pipe characters. Because in um, Unix, Linux operating systems, you use those characters to pipe output from one process as input into another. So pipe characters are usually what you'll hear them called. Now I want to add that or condition that if cont is equal to a lowercase y, And the two upper would fix us too. We just haven't done many ors or any at all. <laughs> it is the shift backslash. So right above your enter, and it's the pipe here. Pipe. Linux calls it a pipe. Windows calls it a vertical bar. Vertical bar. Yeah, Linux used it a long time before. It's easier to say. Linux had it way before Windows. 
Mac probably helped me. So I'm learning too. Uh, Max using, using, <laughs> using Linux, so it's still a pipe. All right, let's try it. Does it work now? Do we, can we use both? I'm going to try my lowercase y. Looks great. Anything else doesn't work. So good deal. We got an or condition in there. Now, let's do a little bit more with our program. We've got our ending kind of working. Let's prompt for that first number. Now, this is still going to be within our do while, but we want this to happen above the stuff that we've added so far. So right under the do, opening curly brace, I'm going to write out a message. And we'll make it say enter number one. Now we're going to do a try parse to check to see if they entered the right input. And we've looked at that try parse. We've done it a bunch of different ways, right? We've used the if statement. We've used it if not. Well, we're going to do a while this time. So we're going to say while I am not able to use the int.try parse to convert whatever gets input from my read line statement out to num1. I need to create a num1 variable. We'll create an integer num1 and num2. Now my while loop is going to be really interesting because it says try to parse whatever you read in as an integer, put the output in num1. Now I put the not in front of it to say, if that's not working, we got a bad number, just keep repeating it until they get it right. Right, so by us saying, making that into a while loop, we're gonna keep repeating this over and over until they finally type in a valid number. So let's give them a message. This is invalid input. And then we want another write statement, and we're going to say enter number one again because that's what we're looking for. Now that'll end that first while statement on our number. Now, sometimes this works really well for our logic to use this while loop. Sometimes it doesn't. When you guys are looking at things in hypergrade, you know, sometimes this was what was used, sometimes not. And of course, you're just trying to read the mind and figure it out. When you get to these last couple in hypergrade is we're looking at the unit exam. If you just have a line or two that's not matching up, but the intent is good, I can tell that you have everything else there. That that's going to be okay, all right? So if you are not matched up perfectly, you're okay, as long as it's just not a huge, giant mess. All right, so let's try this. I want to run this thing, and I should be able to check my number one. I should be able to enter something bad, and it should prompt me again. There it does, enter number one. So no matter how many times we enter some invalid number, we should just get prompted again. And then we can put in a valid number, it should work. Now for my continue, I'm gonna say no. Is it working for everybody? Got it, let's repeat it. So I wanna just copy this whole block. And this block that we're working at, looking at this while loop, would be an awesome method or subprogram. So when we start looking at subprograms next week, That'll be something we're thinking of. Now I'm going to change this in three places from one to two so that it's looking at our second number. The, um, the right and it's associated while. And I just pasted it right below.
So we should be in really good shape. Now we're validating our two numbers. So after the end of our while on our second number, let's put an if statement in. We'll just make it real simple. If num1 is greater than num2, we want to write out num1 is greater else we'll write out figure out how to get rid of those things num2 is greater Now, in this if statement, I didn't use any opening and closing curly braces because I just have the one line of code for each one. Notice how important indenting is. If I hadn't indented this line here under the else, someone else looking at it could really easily think all the rest of this code was part of that else. Or if I had accidentally indented this stuff or it was all somehow the same, Notice how misleading it could be because I've left those curly braces out and then if I on top of that don't indent properly, it's not going to work. Now if you had Python in your 120 class, you know Python demands certain indenting and certain white spaces. So it's good, that's why it was written that way, so they would force programmers to indent properly. They were like, We'll just make it part of the language and then let them try to not indent. And so we all indent, right? Because we're using Python. C sharp, we're not forced to. That white space doesn't affect whether it compiles or not. It's just a matter of looking at it later and making it more readable. So that's why we try to follow those conventions, but we're not forced to, like with Python. Now, is it working? Let's try it. If we run, we should be able to enter invalid input, then valid. We should be able to enter invalid input for number two, put in a real number, and then we should get the correct output, 20 is greater. We should be able to type a Y to continue and have it ask us for our number one again, number two, and tell us that that one is greater. Is it working? Everybody got it? Perfect, that's a really good one. It's a good example for us, and it'll be a good example for us to take this and break it into methods so that we can see how we can organize things a little better. I'm gonna stop the Zoom session. So um, with our, like, the